Hello again, everyone, and welcome to the latest in our series of Talking Sport webinars, a weekly webinar created uh, by 11 Sports in partnership with World Football Summit. Uh, my name is David Garrido. I'm the uh, regular main event host for World Football Summit. Every Thursday, we bring together leading figures from across the industry to share their insights and expertise on the fight back from COVID-19. And today, we're looking at the sports investment landscape, uh, hearing from a group of leading investors to understand how they're approaching this challenging time, but also what opportunities they see for the future. Now, the landscape looks very different to even just six months ago. There is uh, no way of overstating the seismic financial damage done by the global coronavirus pandemic as fixtures and competitions worldwide were postponed or even cancelled altogether. Uh, for some clubs and individuals, it had even deeper consequences. Jobs and livelihoods were at real risk and so on and so forth up the chain. Broadcasters don't get the games they paid for. Advertisers don't get the exposure they hope for. Rights holders don't get that TV revenue because uh, either payments are withheld or they have to be reimbursed. And above all that, the fans suffer the loss of one of the things in life they value the most. But a different landscape doesn't mean a desolate one. Crisis creates opportunity for those smart enough to spot it. Uh, will the value of live TV rights packages be hit so broadcasters want to maximise that, but rights holders might want to redesign and remodel? Will companies like Amazon double down or shy away? Are governing body OTT platforms still viable options? Will certain sports become more attractive for investment? such as esports has now hit the mainstream with increased visibility or women's sport we discussed this last week it undoubtedly picked up momentum before the pandemic hit but it's really facing serious challenges right now how is content affected does the world around the sporting event become more attractive than the 90 minutes or two innings or four rounds or five sets well youtube analytics would say uh, that's where their audience is at what about the athlete themselves, the ecosystem around them? Perhaps that's the most valuable asset out there. Will that attract the budgets? Will influencers be more in demand to capture those eyeballs? Or is that a phase which has passed? There is plenty to discuss uh, in the company of this esteemed panel, and you're about to see them on screen right now. Uh, Michael Spirito, Managing Director of Sapphire Ventures, Massimo Marinelli, CEO of uh, Ace Ventures, Al Guido, President of the San Francisco 49ers and Chairman of Elevate Sports Ventures, Colin Neville, partner at The Rain Group, and guiding the conversation for us as moderator is uh, Chad Biagini, President at Nolan partners. Uh, welcome one and all. We understand this is a, a packed uh, webinar with, with six of us on it, so hopefully uh, the tech will cope. Uh, we'll hear uh, your insights over the next hour or so. Uh, to those who are watching here on Livestorm, plenty of ways to get involved uh, in our session on the right of your screen. Uh, primarily, submit your questions via the questions tab. We'll try to include them. And we'll also ask you your opinion throughout with our polls. The first poll is live right now, and it asks this. Many economists predict a recession due to COVID-19, albeit they disagree on the scope, the length and the scale. Once the pandemic is under control, will the new economic environment have an impact on spending in sports? You have uh, four options there to pick from. Get involved, cast your vote. Uh, we will update you on the result of that and the ones that follow a little bit later on. I'm delighted to see that Chad has reanimated there from the darkness. We can see you now, Chad. Uh, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, David. Thanks for the warm introduction. And we're certainly excited to be with all of you, 11 Sports World Football Summit as well. Thank you. So I'd like to kick off by having all of you do brief 30 second introductions before the Academy Awards music uh, comes into play here for each of you. But many of your organizations are the engines behind brands that we might be familiar with. But we may be less familiar with some of your organization's brand names and what you do. So. Colin, would you mind going first? Brief introduction. What is Rain? Sure. Thanks, Chad. Um, Paul Neville, a partner at the Rain Group. Um, Rain is a global merchant bank focused exclusively on tech, media, and telecom sectors. Um, within those sectors, we double down on areas we think are growing most aggressively. Um, so, sports, digital media, content, uh, gaming, live events. Although live events less so these days. Um, we have two businesses. One is um, a strategic advisory business where we do M&A, capital raising advice for uh, companies large and small. And then we have an investing business uh, where we manage over $4 billion, primarily through a growth equity strategy um, where we back founders and management teams that we're excited about. Wonderful. Thank you. Massimo, pass to you for Acer. Thank you, Chad. And uh, very nice to be on, this, uh, on the stage with you all. Uh, Acer is an investment platform focused on uh, sports and entertainment. Uh, we are effectively the investment company of a successful sports media executive and entrepreneur, Andrea Radrizzani, that built and sold businesses before. 
we obviously are always looking to extend our reach. And in fact, I'm very pleased to see, uh, well, certainly one of our partners on this panel with our, our Guido, the 49ers, uh, given that, uh, you know, one of our main, main assets is uh, is uh, Leeds United and, uh, and uh, they are that in, in that investment. One or other our, our other major investments is 11 sports, a sports distribution platform amongst amongst others. We typically combine the, you know, I would say investment with deep market and the capabilities in the team, you know, represented by the uh, real operating executives in the, in the business, not, not myself. I'm basically responsible for the investment strategy. Massimo, thank you. Al, I'll pass to you. The 49ers probably need no introduction, but tell us about Elevate. Well, I appreciate that, Chad. Yeah. Well, my background, you know, obviously, five times Super Bowl champion, San Francisco 49ers, and then Elevate Sports Ventures, global sports and marketing agency, um, really focused in on properties, um, sponsorship, uh, sweet sales, premium, ticketing, um, and our insights business. We do quite a bit in the valuation space on behalf of teams as they look to develop a new stadium or new arena around the globe. And happy to be partnered with Massimo on Leeds. Hopefully, we can get back to going and get promoted here sh shortly. Thanks, Alan. Michael, if you don't mind being the bookend for us. Absolutely. And, and, and thanks to 11 Sports and also World Football Summit for having me. And it'd be, it'd be nice to have David uh, commentate my life uh, based on, on some of those productions that we've had going on. That'd be, that'd be pretty fun at this point in time. Uh, Sapphire Ventures, uh, a multi-billion dollar uh, uh, venture capital platform in Silicon Valley. Sapphire Sport is the early stage uh, 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 platform at Sapphire. Um, really, we think about the connected consumer, using sport, media, and entertainment as the backdrop for that. Uh, we're differentiated uh, in as much as our LP, LP base is concerned. We, are, uh, uh, we have LPs that span all of global sport, media, and entertainment from team ownership groups, uh, uh, Al and the San Francisco 49ers, of course, being one of those, uh, uh, to leagues, uh, to uh, uh, events, to athletes, uh, to media rights holders, et cetera. So using sport media entertainment as the backdrop, we are technology investors and in how the consumer is moving. Thank you, Michael. So questions for the group. Many industries, most industries, have been affected quite a bit by this pandemic. And I'd say sports, tourism, entertainment have probably been hit disproportionately hard. Uh, you look at jobs, ticket sales. If you're in ticket sales, probably not much to do these days. In, in your world, I imagine you're busier than ever. What's the role of an investor through and post-COVID? First and foremost, uh, um, for those of us with portfolios, it, it's making sure that our companies have, have the tools and, and uh, um, information and everything that they need to move forward. So uh, making sure that the balance sheets are strong to get through this crisis, making sure that they're focused on whatever part of the organization uh, uh, needs, to be, needs to be focused on uh, um, in, this, in this time, like product development in a lot of ways seen uh, companies actually take this opportunity to develop a product where they not otherwise because a certain sales channel might have turned off. Um, and most importantly is making sure that they're working with the customer in new and innovative ways because we've seen nothing else that the role of technology as we get this crisis is also accelerate the other side of it. Uh, technology is more now than, than ever uh, brand, be it a team, be it league, be it a consideration, be it a media rights. Yeah, yeah I, you know, for, oh, go ahead, Kyle. I would just echo um, Michael's comments. We spent the first three weeks of, of the crisis getting our, our hands and wrapping our heads around a portfolio to over 30 companies at this point. So, uh, we, we did a pretty extensive risk assessment and we were in regular dialogue with our CEOs and management teams. Um, you know, fortunately, we've bet on some sectors that were more digitally focused. Um, so we've we've had some pretty good success stories, actually, in a couple companies that have accelerated. Um, of course, the ones that are more exposed to live events, um, you know, we're, we're figuring out liquidity positions and making sure, as Michael alluded to, balance sheets, balance sheets are strong. Um, but now we've turned the corner and we're looking for opportunities. And on the advisory side of our business, uh, the number of inbounds from leagues and teams and companies looking for capital um, is probably one of the highest points in, in my career. So 
Um, luckily, we, we stabilized the house um, for now, at least. No one, no one really knows the future and, and really turning towards ways that we can find exciting opportunities and, and help the next, next set of businesses grow. Yeah, I'd echo what those guys said. I mean, it's fascinating when you think about this. I mean, we've really only been this, in this for a little over three months. It might feel like 10 years to everyone, but um, I sort of, when I serve two purposes, right? Operating a NFL football franchise and obviously being a chairman of a global sports enterprise. I have my finger on the pulse in the sense of, um, we represent about 40 properties at Elevate Sports Ventures. We operate in 14 states in the US and three countries. Um, and Chad, you know this because I've been on calls with you, like whatever's happening in the Bundesliga or La Liga or the NFL or MLB, I'm really on every single one of those calls around getting these leagues back to play. And I would say, just like these guys, your first inclination is to check in and make sure that obviously people have the bandwidth or it's companies we've invested in, they have the liquidity needs that they, you know, to get through all of this. Then the next question turns to, you know, look, I call it the infinite game. Uh, you know, 2020 is going to be tough. There's no doubt about it. But the question becomes is, how are we prepared to come out of this? Um, and all of us went through contingency planning. We're probably at that point where we've done 20 different contingency plans. Quite frankly, at Elevate and really at the 49 49ers, a little bit focused on 20 because we're going to play a season. But at Elevate, you know, solely focused in on 21 um, and what you know global sports looks like coming out of this pandemic. Thank you. What, what would all of you say to CEOs right now who are trying to decide between protecting all cash that they have on hand to actually taking investment and investing into the future of their organizations or a rebound? It, it's, um, it's a little bit of both, right? And, and as we all alluded to, making sure that, that companies have strong balance sheets, not only to get through this, but to be in a position to accelerate out of it uh, is about most important. So, for a lot of our portfolio companies, as Colin mentioned, we're seeing as much of the flow as we've ever seen. So a lot of the companies that are currently pitching, look at eight plus month runway. It's a pretty critical number, at least in the venture capital. The early stage investors, you know, we're kind of in the seed uh, and even some C investment stage. Um, you know, we like to see month runway. Uh, as you, you think about how that cash is invested, it really depends on, on where these companies are playing. Because by and large, if you are a technology provider, uh, to the media rights holders, the team, the leagues, uh, et cetera, there is going to be opportunity uh, to be a part of how this industry looks, how this industry is redefined on the other side of it. So if you are conserving cash too much, you're not investing in your product, you're not investing in your recruitment, you're not investing in your business development channel cycles, then you're not going to be positioned to accelerate the other side of it. So it's a little bit above each company, each industry is going to look a little bit differently. It was probably conservation a little bit more on the other side of it, which may be continuing right now. It's accelerated and it can increase investment as we start this fall or even with 2021. Yeah, if I if I can add to that, I think you know ultimately you know there is always going to be differences from company to company. But I mean, my message would be you know not to take the eyes off the eyes, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you know if you look in sports, there is going to be some companies that uh, ultimately they got a very strong assets with longevity ahead of them, and you know obviously in value, and that's why you know in the short term you got to be sure you got the liquidity and the strong balance sheet to be able to you know see through. The lack of revenues you might have in the medium, uh, in, in the medium and short term, and you know, although you might, might have some uncertainty over the next few months, you know, people back in the stadium or things like that. Ultimately, you know, I think we all know that uh, in a hundred years' time, people will still want to go and watch a 49ers game or, you know, whatever, whatever other successful sport. Right? So ultimately, it's to maintain, uh, you know, the credibility and visibility into what you're building and. Uh, Make sure that uh, there is a there is a, a strategy that can execute and focus on execution. I think we also see a lot of uh, a lot of acceleration of some new new trends with this uh, with this pandemic. To be fair, I think you know sports has been one that I know. I think you you covered in uh, or has been covered in this uh, in this setting 
last week. So there will certainly be some new things that I think also Kong was referring to that will accelerate with this, uh, with Karen and Bob. Yeah, I'd say in our portfolio, there's no one blanket um, piece of advice that we give. Uh, it's, it's very tailored to the situation. You know, we've, on one end of the spectrum, one of our investments, um, DraftKings, went public uh, during coronavirus. Um, I think it was the first company to have a virtual bell ringing in April. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we have you know companies that are in the live events, concert space, and it's all about um, cash preservation and survival. So um, it's, it's really got to tailor your advice and, and guidance based on the situation. Yeah, I said very well. I don't, I mean, for us, we're, you know, I view us like a custom development shop. I mean, every, every conversation is very, very different depending upon uh, investment, uh, owner. Uh, you know, I have uh, companies inside of LA Sports Ventures or properties or teams that are right in the midst of having their seasons canceled or postponed. I have others that are embarking on building stadiums. You know, we have three MLS properties that will open in 2022 or 2023. Those haven't been impacted at all. Um, frankly, there's a ton of opportunity as you think through the growth and scale of those businesses. So I think to everybody's point that we just made, um, it's really a property by property or company by company strategy. Thanks everyone. And guess when you look at the word investment, not all investments cost money per se, right? It's the time where you can invest into your people, you can develop them. We see lots of organizations cross training their employees to make sure that they understand how the rest of the business works so that they can rebound with, with better strengths than before. I'm going to go to a poll that we asked the audience beforehand and I'll bring it to all of you. So many economists predict some sort of recession. They're, they're disagreeing maybe on the scale and the scope of it. But once we get this pandemic under control, will the new economic impact our environment impact spending in sports? The, uh, Split decisions. So we're, all, we're almost a quarter all the way across from no people and businesses crave sports. Uh, the next answer, consumption's high, but more people be, will be viewing it at home. The next, consumer spending will remain high, but corporate spending might diminish. And the final answer is sports will be significantly impacted for years and, and truly almost 25% in each of those answers. So I'm going to float it across to all of you. What's your expectation? Once the virus is under control, what do you see as the impact on the sports economy, so to speak? Well, if we're talking about recession, um, then you, know, you, you have to look at it in two ways. First of all, corporate versus consumer, and, and secondly, um, for what kind of time? Um, so with recession, you know, corporate uh, spending and corporate sponsorship will, in the short term, most likely uh, be impacted. We saw that in 2008, 2009, um, and, and that uh, to some extent, short term uh, 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 sports back. Um, you know, depending on a lot of things and a lot of matches that we've seen, including that. But on the, on the consumer side, um, there's never been more pent up demand for, for entertainment, uh, you know, further than the ratings that. The Bundesliga has, has been getting over the past three weeks. We looked at further than how many people tuned in to watch Tom if he really had a golf the weekends ago. Not much to watch and so much man that people um, are probably at the mouth to, to consume sports. Now that consumption um, is probably going to look different for some period of time. And at the end of this, and when we do come out of it, ideally it will look different going forward in a better way. We'll have better products, we'll have more engagement, we'll have more interactivity. We will have more of a connection between team, athlete, lead, brand, and the end consumer. Um, and you can you know, think about that as, as, as how we as an industry are strengthening ourselves for long-term viability. Um, so when you look at the consumer, it's about what, should, you know, what percentage of the wallet what wallet there is going into entertainment. I don't think that's going to change much. As a matter of fact, that rating is coming out of this because of the pent-up. Yeah, Chad, if, if, you know, if you, if I 
uh, Michael says, what I, what I would add perhaps is that uh, ultimately, you know, when we look at sports, and the reason why we like sports is that uh, it is an underutilized and underdeveloped asset class. And so, you know, obviously, it'd be, it'd be rational to say there has been a short term impact, right? I mean, at least in some part of sports, obviously, you know, calling as in some other parts where there haven't been or entertainment more broadly, like, you know, gaming and, and things like that. But, you know, we obviously, with our assets, you know, if you think of a Leeds United not being able to host home games, obviously, you know, it's very clear that uh, you're going to have an impact on revenue. So those short term impacts will be there. But because of the opportunities that are in the sector, we, we remain very confident this is absolutely a good space to be. And in fact, you know, this creates opportunities. But obviously, to be mindful of what would be the broader economic uh, impact uh, and the ability of uh, consumers to spend in the current environment. So, of course, you know, it's uh, it's not something to be forgotten, but we remain positive about about the sector. So. I'm going to go to the questions that are coming through on the screen. So Adrian Bevington, thank you. He's asking as the spike of COVID reduces and we enter into some level of normality, will we begin to see an increase in acquisitions of clubs and leagues that may be in financial distress across Europe and particularly those in the UK? And then his subsequent question, is this a major opportunity for equity groups with large capital to invest? So I'll throw that to the group. Yeah, I'll take that first, just because we're um, working on several situations in Europe across um, the football landscape in particular. Um, I, I think as is always the case in European football, uh, it's a, they're the haves and the have nots. You know, what, certain groups that have incredible balance sheet and firepower based on their ownership. Um, and certain groups that are, are less well capitalized. Um, it's pretty ugly, to be honest, across across some of these leagues in terms of the liquidity situation right now. Um, I think, thankfully, a lot of the broadcasters have been working with the leagues um, to, to make those payments. Um, but yes, this will be a, a buyer's market without a doubt, um, on, especially on the football side. Um, you know, especially player transfer revenue and a lot of these streams that, um, clubs relied on uh, won't be there for, for the near term. So, um, yeah, I think this is a great buying opportunity. I still believe, as, as Massimo said, in the long term potential of these clubs, and you have to think of them as long term potential. But as always, when you go through situations like we are in right now, the strong typically get stronger. So, um, yeah, I think it's a great opportunity to, to be out there. I completely agree with Colin. I, I mean, I think there's opportunities for buyers out there right now. Um, and I agree. I mean, getting back to it, cause it, it's dovetails into the question that you just asked prior to this chat or the poll, like I'm a buyer of sport. I mean, when is our, con our content has never been more needed than it is now. If you love sports, I mean, think about your day and your life as it stands today, any sport that they put on is getting record ratings. Um, even if it's literally like, I mean, anybody that watched the last, uh, the last dance in the U S with Michael Jordan or across the world, you know, the engagement levels for that. If you look at it, like 72% of brands still want to extend sports sponsorships. If we look at all these content companies, if they didn't have sports, what would they be? Um, so for me, like I, I'm probably more bullish. Um, I worked for the Dallas Cowboys from 2007 to 2009 was probably the worst time, you know, arguably uh, in the world. And, and we broke a ton of revenue records. We did $600 million in seat licenses and the next highest, or the previous highest was $150 million, you know, $20 billion got spent from call it 2008 to 2014 or 15. When you look at new stadia across the country. And so infrastructure went on a boom. Look, I don't, you know, does that happen right away? Probably not, but I think Colin's right. I mean, if you're, if you're, uh, if you have dry powder and you love sports, um, there will be opportunities out there for people. Um, and I do, I just believe that, um, fans will come back. And, uh, I think any, every single poll, if you took it from day one, do you take it to now? If you ask me today, would Levi stadium be full with 70,000 people in September? If it was voluntary, like if the County and the city let us, I think the answer is probably yes. Um, now we have a lot to learn, but I truly believe that fans will come back. That's great. Follow up to. Go ahead. I'm sorry, go on. I was going to say kind of follow up to that last question. So we've seen varying degrees of success from investment groups and sports acquisitions. Some who took organizations and, and made them immensely better 
and others less so. So if, if you are advising a new owner who's closed on a property, what, what's the first one or two things they need to do to make sure they're successful after they've acquired a league or, or a property? I'm, I'm happy to, to go to that. I mean, I think ultimately, you know, the, the focus has to be on execution. I mean, uh, you know, it's probably not any different than it is in, uh, in other investments, in other sectors, to be fair. You know, obviously, you know, typically when you do an investment, you want to focus on uh, what the opportunity is and uh, what's the team that is going to be working on that opportunity and identify, you know, whether it's the right team or whether there needs some changes into into that team. Uh, but ultimately, you know, you need to make sure you can execute your strategy. Uh, obviously, stra strategy can change, you know, what you go into an investments with is not necessarily what you're going to end, uh, end up, you know, coming out with it. And, you know, there are obviously a lot of full business sports i'm not just thinking about teams here but you know particularly in the sports tech perhaps arena that need to pivot in their lifetime but uh it's important that uh, you got uh, you got the right execution in mind and you focus on it to make sure you're gonna you're gonna end up where it's the right place to be so i, I don't i don't think actually it's probably different than it is for, for other sectors but perhaps some of my uh, some of the colleagues here might, might want to add whether you're a technology investor or you're investing in in team or league assets you're going to be successful if you think about investment as a long-term investment right and if you're focused uh principally on two things what your product is um and making sure that you're investing in that product uh, not just at the at the outset when you first um uh, purchase the asset over the long uh, course of time and then ultimately focus on your fan or, or fan or end customer and you're probably going to be in a better position to be long term successful if you think about that investment over the long period of time if you're looking to flip an asset if you're looking to, to get in because simply of the league economics or the fact that there's buying right now then you're probably not going to be best positioned to be long-term successful yeah i would just add when we make investments we spend six months plus typically with our management teams and owners before we make an investment um so it's a little bit late if you're you know trying to figure that out once you've made the investment um, usually that's when things go wrong uh, that's from our perspective at least We have another popular question that's come into the group. So Claire, thanks for asking this one. Will women's sports suffer as a result of the COVID-19 fallout? Or do you think investors may actually see this unexpected pause as an opportunity in the space? I'm seeing more focus on, on women's athletics than ever. Um, look at you know, the Athletes Unlimited platform that's recently been launched uh, by a friend of all of ours, John Patrickoff. I've seen Three business plans in the last two weeks for men focused uh, digital media platform. So, uh, you know, from an activity perspective, I think, uh, you know, we've never seen more uh, activity around it. And, you know, as we move from a consumption culture perspective to a more one on one and personalized and technology driven uh, consumption pattern. But that opens up more and more channels uh, through which uh, connect uh, via whatever the, the content paradigm is. So, you know, that, that I think certainly serves well as these initiatives and as these pro uh, products and projects are on. Yeah, listen, I, uh, I'm with Michael. Um, I would start with I hope and pray not. As a father of three girls, um, I'll tell you. Um, I am very passionate about women's sports. Um, I'm actually right after this, I'm going to take my daughters to uh, have a basketball lesson later on today. They're in their soccer clubs and competitive leagues. So uh, I'm with Michael. I think, you know, as content shifts uh, and it's easier to get it in the hands of people who desire it, um, you know, there are tremendous athletes um, on the pitch, field, court, ice, you know, whatever you want to call it. And, uh, you know, we are definitely seeing some opportunities in that space, um, primarily really here in the U.S. But, Chad, I certainly hope so, um, because I think it I think it's well deserved and earned. Um, and folks like ourselves, I think it's key that we're invested in it, um, you know, not just from 
uh, cash and dollars, but from an operational perspective um, to grow those leagues and teams. Yeah, I mean, I can uh, can uh, definitely second that. I mean, uh, we actually are definitely looking at that space as an area of uh, more investment with our portfolio of companies. So we think, you know, ultimately it's uh, it's uh, as, a, as, a, as I think about what I was saying before, you know, sports is an un underutilized, underdeveloped asset class. And this is obviously, as I was indicated by this question, you know, another great example where you know, there is opportunity for sure. Yeah, I, I would agree as well. We recently worked with the NWSL owners to recruit their new commissioner, and we had an overwhelmingly positive response of strong, capable global executives who were interested in that role. So I think that women's sports continues to climb the ladder. And uh, I'm with you, Al. I've got two girls myself. It's a, it's a very important area that we all need to continue championing and being behind. Um, how would you recommend sports organizations look at innovating during this time of nobody in stadiums? I mean, is now the time to test and try new things that you might not have tried in a previous environment? Colin, I'll throw it to you. Yeah, I, the one example that comes to mind, um, we're, we're the first investors in um, the PLL, which is uh, the cross league here in the United States. And um, NIL has been helpful and involved there. Uh, Paul and Mike Rabel, the, the two co-founders and brothers, um, you know, I think we're the first to market in creating this quarantine tournament um, that they just announced this morning. They're doing in Utah. Um, so they, you know, they had a 15 week season that got condensed to two weeks. Um, one of the reasons why they went that route is um, NBC, their, our media and broadcast partner, lost the Olympics. So we had an incredible opportunity to take what is, you know, an emerging sport um, globally, but certainly, especially in the U.S., and shine a light on it during this time. Uh, so they'll have a two-week tournament. They'll be broadcast on NBC, the big NBC network and across their portfolio. Um, and, and really, you know, we're ahead of the game in terms of this quarantined, one-location type tournament. Um, so that's that's one example that comes to mind. Um, you know, the other, the other example I would just mention is on the digital acquisition front, uh, for a lot of our businesses that are looking for new customers and users, this period we're seeing, you know, acquisition rates that we haven't seen in a very long time in terms of what it costs to acquire a customer. So creative ad campaigns, um, you know, we're encouraging our, our well capitalized companies to acquire customers right now. Um, and, and as Michael and Al alluded to emerge from this in a position of strength. It, it couldn't be a better time to focus on, on product. If you're selling into these channels, we have we have a, a socially enabled uh, um, buy flow within Viva, uh, and with our investors, they work with hundreds of U.S. sports teams, and uh, had been accelerating their business quite nicely going into COVID. Now it's an opportunity for them to iterate on the product and continue to work on those sales channels, such that when we come out of the social portion of the buy flow where you can share your recommendations with friends, where you can uh, get together as a group and have where you can make that easier for people to come in the state. That's going to be a more important piece uh, of the commerce solution than ever. So if they're working on the product, working on the system, you have a bigger portion of that, um, of that opportunity. Out of it. We have an audio technology company that had predominantly been deployed in music. So, obviously, as Colin alluded to, with all fans down, it's you know anyone who's operating in, in the live events. But for an early stage company that was taking its audio solution in the sport realm, they've been able to take a look at what's really needed right now from a solution perspective. From a product so they are now having deployments in or driving uh, uh, content engagements at stadiums. They're taking their solution and they're using it both to test at sports stadiums. So they're they're starting proof of concept to product to better enable their sales channel, not only during the time. Yeah, I'll. I'll these guys hit it well on the investment side. I'll touch on it as an operator a bit in, in my 49ers world. I think there's no better time to 
everyone's you know trying to figure out you know what the hole looks like in 2020 and how to climb out of it that's the obvious and so uh innovation comes in a number of different ways from a monetization perspective you've seen in the mls example or announced with the other day some virtual led that i think espn and and Univision is going to allow the teams to participate in. You've seen the MLB start to look at uh, additional entitlements that they probably haven't done before. You've seen, you know, the NFL look to open up content streams that maybe always got piled into the national broadcast levels. And so how you slice and dice the pie um, is going to be really, really important. And so there's no doubt that's probably where my focus is as an operator. And then, the, you know, we can't forget about the, operations side of our business, the cost side, fan experience side, there's, you know, we don't know what this will look like. And so, you know, there's, of course, like the easy one is sanitation. You know, the, the more difficult answer is, are we talking about thermal screening scanning technology and contact tracing across our fan bases um, in the future, right? If you think about after 9-11, no one would have thought about walking into a stadi stadium through a magnetometer. Um, and so how we, uh, you know, how we evolve from an operations perspective. I don't want to go too far because obviously my hope is people much smarter than me on the medical side will find a vaccine and a cure. Um, so you don't want to sort of, uh, you know, go too far down that path, but there are going to be things that we learn from moving forward that I think are going to become norms in our stadia across, across the globe that really aren't norm today. I, I would definitely, again, you know, probably focus also a little bit on uh, this uh, new new sector, if you want that uh, came out of this or new, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, in, into what could be this new sensor, performance tracking, health tech, let's say, that obviously has spiked the post coronavirus and we've seen a lot of uh, innovations coming our way following, uh, uh, you know, the, the you know, in, in the last three months, let's say. Uh, what I what I would say also is that definitely, you know, we as a, you know, in, in the operating businesses that uh, Azure has, you know, for example, within 11, you know, we always try to see what other things we can do. And for example, you know, the watch together technology has been very successful in uh, letting watch games basically together, almost being in the same room and connecting. And so there are always things that, that you can try and do. And uh, from that perspective, actually, you know, being uh, being forced at home, you know, all these new technologies, we hope you can give a further push. So you you gotta obviously watch out uh, the balance sheet as we were saying before, but it's a it's a great time to test some of these new new technologies that are coming that are coming our way. I'll stay on that for a moment and go over to the poll. So we had asked the audience during this season of uncertainty and lack of game day revenue, where should sports properties invest? The question the answers were new technology, health and safety, people, social impact, or don't invest and protect cash at all costs. Only 2% said don't invest, so 98% saying invest in something. And the overwhelming majority, a little over two thirds, said new technology. So let's stay on new technology for a moment. What are some things you're seeing right now that you're excited about uh, as they grow in the sports industry? Michael, can I put you on the spot? That's a space you know well. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, good that on, a, on an investment panel, only 2% of participants uh, in the poll said that not investing uh, was the order of the day. So I think I think we have the right audience here. Um, but but from a technology invest, investment perspective, I'll say it again: it's it's any piece of technology that can better connect the brand. That brand is the team, the league, the confederation, athlete. Increasingly, uh, uh, that technology that can connect that entity to the consumer. So if you look at, you know, let's just take one big example in our world, uh, which we all know well, let's take media rights. Uh, obviously, with no fans in stadiums, uh, um, the merchandise being, uh, being, impacted, being impacted and sort of from an in-person uh, perspective being impacted, the media rights are really propagating the industry right now. So how can you inject technology into that world to uh, better the experience? Uh, Foster more engagement, foster more interactivity. Uh, um, you know, and as you said at the beginning, you know, looking at even just content, right? How is content being created? What type of content are people consuming? Now that we're three months into this, consumption habits have been formed, consumption habits have been made. The type of content and the type of media 
people are consuming and how they're doing it and the platforms on which they're doing are changing. So the technology that's going into that world, and again, the media rights world and sport is tens and hundreds of millions of dollars. Right? So the technology that's modernizing that, that's helping create better product to connect that media rights holder, that team, that league to the fan is ultimately going to be uh, uh, good from a long-term investment. We're seeing the same from our seat as well. There's been a significant increase in sports teams hiring chief technology officers, and that's focusing on stadium infrastructure, but also digital investments and, and what types of products that they might purchase or build. And similarly, chief marketing officers whose roles are less about game day experience and more about how do we connect with our dozens to hundreds of millions of fans around the world. Because many of our properties were so focused locally for a long time and seeing the next place we need to go is, hey, we have fans in Australia, in Asia, in North America, in Europe, and how do we make sure that they're connected to the club at all times? And, and technology in all sorts of fashions are going to be what solves that. There's no, there's no question about it. And when we think about um, our partners and, and who the LPs in our fund are, whether it's the York family and the San Francisco 49ers or City Football Group, uh, owners of Manchester City and other clubs around the world, the fans that they have are not just local fans. They count into the hundreds of millions of fans globally and the products that you can develop. And again, there's no better time to develop product than right now when the asset is not on the field, on the pit, on the court. The product that you can develop right now, the investment that you can make right now to better connect your brand to the hundreds of millions of fans that are increasingly uh, building up demand to consume your product, that's, that's what's going to lead this industry into the future. And I fundamentally believe that coming out of this and into the future, we are going to have better products, we are going to be better serving, better engaging our fans and our community. I totally agree with Michael, we just you know, need to probably find the next thing to do together. I'm going to go to another question that's had a lot of popularity over in the uh, in fan community or customer communication platform over here. It's really cool what you guys have done with, with this platform. Uh, Francisco, so you've asked, let me pop it up on the screen. In this new environment, this new normality, what are the key levers a financial sponsor can activate within a club to create value? For example, from digital and new engagement opportunities to more traditional levers like pricing, sponsorship. Al Guido, I'm going to put you on the spot there because you represent a lot of properties in selling sponsorship and activating sponsorship. How would you reply to this? I think the uh, the first one that um, they mentioned from the digital and new engagement opportunities are right like spot on. I mean everyone's looking to engage um, with content in an organic way and when sports aren't being played fans are thirsting for that content. They're first, they're thirsting for access to our players um, and what they're up to at these times. And so, you know, from our sponsor perspective, Chad, I mean, your traditional rate card obviously would have some IP rights. It would might have some signage and branding. Obviously, if you're in a world where signage and brand signage and branding is maybe not as important because we're playing in stadia with no fans, um, then the digital footprint becomes so important. Um, and how fans and brands can interact with those. So that's what we're seeing across our landscape. Um, again, it's not that brands aren't willing to spend money because they are right now, but how they engage with a property and or what assets they take on are extremely important. And I'll go to a point Colin made on just sort of fan acquisition costs. Um, at the same time, from an investment perspective, there's a number of different platforms we have at Elevate and that we're looking into um, from a sponsorship ROI perspective, because if you get outside of the traditional linear um, broadcast models, right, which are sort of easy to rate, and you get into a social and digital world, um, it does become a point where what value are you bringing to a brand and how are you transparency, tra transparently telling them what that value is relative to data and metrics, impressions, et cetera. And so um, I think for, for my perspective, it's all within that digital content um, as we look to engage with our brands. 
One trend I'll add from a purely U.S. perspective, we've spent a lot of time recently around the RSN business, which Michael knows well. Um, and there is a, a looming shakeout on the horizon in that business model. And it's a significant source of revenue for a lot of the U.S. clubs in the NBA and Major League Baseball and NHL. And I think, um, you know, figuring out what the next uh, – delivery mechanism for on a local basis. So we talked earlier about global, um, which is right about Man City and those big brands. But the local revenue stream for a lot of these clubs is, is a huge portion of their income statement. And, um, you know, right now, I think there's a general feeling that it's going to be very tricky to replace those revenues as cord cutting accelerates. And the trend that was happening pre coronavirus, I think has unfortunately only accelerated. Um, and, you know, subscribers are, are dropping off their cable packages at alarming rates right now. Um, and, and that's been the best business model in media and sports for 15 years. And um, so figuring out the leagues, figuring out how to replace those revenue streams with creative packages, um, creative OTT solutions, packaging rights in ways they haven't previously uh, will be critical for the next 10 years. We, we could do an entirely separate panel about that topic alone. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Definitely. So, I, I guess, I guess you know the other thing. The other thing we should probably not forget ultimately is that uh, there's still an opportunity to just you know focus on uh, what's inside these leagues and what other sort of services could be offered. You know, we, for example, think a lot of a lot of focus potentially in uh, the CRM space. You know, there are you know a lot of uh, a lot of businesses that are you know in that space, and I think opportunity in CRM for leagues more more generally. That's why we would also focus on. So taking investing another step. So there's the there's the financial growth aspect, but there's also the concept of impact investing. A lot of these sports properties have a huge opportunity to build communities and, and enhance social impact. And, and I know some of your owners and your organizations are very passionate for that as well. And how do we invest in the good of sport as we go forward? Massimo, I'll put you on the spot first because I know Andrea yeah. does a significant amount of this in underserved, under-resourced communities. Yeah, I, absolutely. Look, I mean, at the end of the day, COVID has been a humanitarian crisis, I think, for our lifetimes, right? I mean, you know, we all look at these, uh, you know, very, very, very horrible numbers every day. And it's, you know, something that we we definitely need to, need to keep in mind. I mean, across our portfolio, you know, we've been working to offer support wherever we can. So, for example, you know, we use the network that we own to support and promote the WHO messages and making sure that people, you know, comply with that as much as possible. You know, and all of our portfolio companies has been that, you know, leads, as you mentioned, they done no support to help vulnerable people in, uh, in the recent months. So definitely we want to support uh, however possible. I mean, ultimately, I think, you know, no team can be successful without a strong community and a fan base behind it. Uh, and I think, you know, ultimately, this one of the success factors, for example, you know, we saw in our, you know, two, three year ownership of Leeds has definitely been the ability to uh, connection with the city and with the fan base. And I think that's definitely, you know, one, one of the highlights that see in our, in our ownership that uh, I think it's definitely a testament. You need to you need to be very very mindful of the, the need to to promote the good together with your uh, with your investments. Uh, at the industry level, you know, I think I would say that uh, we need to continue to be positive in investment. You know, showing support for startups that want to be innovative, and you know, we're trying. I think everybody's panel right now is trying to do that within their organizations and support possible to various programs. You know, accelerators to start with, for example, that that may be out there. Uh, if not, you know, the portfolio companies already in their, uh, in their portfolio. So, you know, we can, uh, we can and must absolutely do that because ultimately it's a requirement of uh, our world. Chad, I, I mean, this is something we're very passionate about. Um, and it, look, it's time to break the cycle of, you know, Colin mentioned as far as investing, as far as, you know, have, have nots or look, it, you know, global pandemic or the racial divide in our world right now. Um, you know, the people, unfortunately, with um, you know, social socioeconomic status. You know, if you think about schools, right, those who had to go to work and their kids are in 
low income areas and what they're facing on a daily basis. The San Francisco 49ers, like the York family, I couldn't give them more credit. I mean, we have a school inside of our facility. We have eight full-time teachers. We do 60,000 kids K through eight, and we've been doing it for the last seven years. Um, and now, like now it's time to double down on that. Uh, you know, this pandemic, um, as we all know, millions and millions of people will lose their jobs. Kids will be impacted. Um, and then if we don't do anything as sports teams or leagues or investors in these communities, the cycle will just continue. And so I think it's an unbelievably important time in our world and as teams to be leaders in this space. Um, you know, at the San Francisco 49ers, obviously 90 some percent of our players are African-American. If you think about what's going on in the world, we need to change these things in our countries. Um, and people look to folks like this on the panel. They look to teams that they love to represent um, what they want to see in the world. And that's not just dollars, that's actions. Statements are great. Um, and I'm so happy like every time I read a new statement, um, but it's imperative that these organizations use their capital, use their bandwidth, use their brand um, to socially impact um, and economically impact those who are most hurt during these times. Um, you know, and I think about, you know, what we're all going through right now, Chad, and even your group, I'll give you like, you know, should every sports team have an equity officer? Um, should, you know, there should, there should be even more emphasis placed on diversity and inclusion than there already probably was or is. And so uh, I look at that as an opportunity for all of us to learn um, and to identify what's really going on in the world um, and to take a stand and to act against it. And, uh, and I think, well, if we all do that right now, we'll come out uh, a much better society. That's a great answer, Al. Thank you. And, and we certainly are starting to see that organizations talking about heads of social impact or chief diversity officers and saying it, it can't just be a statement. We actually have to actually measure, did we make an impact? And, and how do we measure that? And let's be quite intentional. And uh, Silicon Valley was making that move years ago was starting to look at their, their sustainable and their environmental uh, investments as our uh, causes as impact investments. So are we getting a return? And is the return the maximum return we could get for making a difference in the world or in the community we're serving, which, which I do think we'll see more sports organizations do. Uh, I'll go to the poll. We've got one final poll and then we'll, we'll go to a question that's popular right now and trending. If you had to place a bet, I'm going to ask each of you this. So, so quick answers on it. If you had to place a bet, what's the next fastest growing sector in the sports industry? in the next five years? Is it A, sports betting, B, esports, three or C, new digital platforms, or D, expansion of existing sports into new markets, such as the NFL into Europe or cricket into America, et cetera. So sports betting, esports, digital expansion of the existing. Colin, you first. Um, well, I'm biased. I'll say sports betting, but uh, we're one of the largest shareholders of DraftKings, so you gotta take that into consideration. Um, my unbiased answer, just to try to diversify a little bit, I would say D. Uh, one of the trends that we've talked about a while at Rain is the professionalization, the globalization of sport. You know, from 10 years ago um, versus where where the industry is now on a global basis. And we're working with leagues in Asia and Australia, um, and there's a ton of opportunity uh, for those leagues to grow. Take some of the best practices from. Uh, more more developed markets and apply them. There's huge opportunity, and as an investor, um, you know the entry price is more attractive. Uh, so that's that's how we think about the world. Al, uh, double down on that. Um, yes, I think it was already there, frankly. Um, but as you look at some of these states and the holes in which we're in, and the dollars you're seeing, um, it's unbelievable how fast tracked those who don't have um, gambling in the U.S. from a state-by-state -state perspective to how quickly it's ramped up in the last uh, three or four months. So I'm um, with Colin, not just because he's had a, you know, a good time and he's biased. I'm, I don't think he's biased. I think that's the right space. Michael, over to you. Can, is, is tripling down a, a betting, or a betting <laughs> term? Um, look, all, all, all are very positively indexed, not only to what's happening, but, but what the future uh, trend going to be, but have you seen DraftKings price? 
Um, have you seen all the articles about the fact that uh, uh, people who are waiting around to bet more on sports and bet more in states that are now accelerating their move to get betting legalized, that these people are actually propagating the stock market because of their day trading? Uh, the, the, the movement in the sports betting area, even given um, some of the uh, the measures that are holding it back in this country, uh, uh, all of those trend lines show that that that, that will will absolutely be the breakout uh, amongst these. So I'll, I'll use one of the few betting terms I know. Can we go for a superfecta, Massimo? Do you have the same answer, <laughs> or would you take I, I, else? I would actually spread my bets. Um, I think you know. Obviously, I understand exactly. You know, I think that you, know, you can see the different location. I guess we're based in. I mean, uh, obviously. You know, sports betting, I can understand in the U.S. with the, all the changes going on there, it's going to be massive. I think probably in absolute term, you know, I definitely I definitely agree with it. I guess, you know, the other area I would highlight, perhaps because I think it's starting still from a lower base, is esports. Um, ultimately, you know, there is a, there is a, a lot of uh, consumption there, but still not as much revenues as you have seen. And sometimes when I look at it, you know, when I started my career, you know, there was this pie chart that showed much time people spend reading newspapers and how much money spent on newspapers and you know the father ultimately you know, there was a, a, lot, a lot more a lot more time uh, spent into the money spent in digital and i think you know, in a sense we're, we're going to see that in esports where you know a lot of a lot of time is spent on esports you know i think people need to understand whether those are profitable audiences uh, but generally at least in terms of ups the, or, or you know in terms of there is a, also a big opportunity there i, I would think Although perhaps in absolute terms, not as, as, uh, as sports betting. I'll, I'll give you the answers as they came in. And, and mind you, we have a very global audience today. So I see the three Americans all said sports betting because it's not as prevalent in America. <laughs> while another market, as Massimo, Massimo rightly points out, it's already of significant scale elsewhere. Esports and new digital platforms tied for first. Expansion of existing sports into new markets gets the third place spot. And sports betting was actually the lowest, but they were all quite popular. Uh, one final question, because it's one that's popped up and, and has received a lot of popularity in here. I'll bring it on the screen. Luis Vicente, do you believe there will be more fit to purpose models for investors in sports after COVID? And what is your point of view over recent rumors of CBC, TPG and KKR discussions for commercial joint ventures with some of the European top soccer leagues? Uh, it's an active trend. Um, I, I can tell you the number of inbounds uh, from traditional institutional investors that have CVC has spent a lot of time in sport over the years, and um, we, we have a lot of respect for them. Uh, it's it's getting more competitive. Um, people that in groups that have had no interest historically in sports um, are doubling down. Um, we, we did a deal last de December with uh, Manchester City and Silver Lake. Um, you're starting to see a lot of big funds um, see the opportunity in the space. Um, and I think the, the environment right now will, will only increase that interest. Uh, as leagues and, and teams look for liquidity, they look for um, you know more ways to monetize uh, and get the capital they need to grow. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, agree. That question was an inside job. Massimo, you take it. Exactly. As a second, we walk off saying, because ultimately, you know, it's absolutely on the spot. You know, there is, uh, I'd say, you know, I mean, uh, I'd say to Luis, you know, now more than ever, this is required. You know, I mean, uh, there is a there is perfect time, you know, call it as I, why? Uh, and I think, you know, there are many, many investors out there that I could see this as, as an opportunity. Uh, however, I would say, you know, there needs to be the requirement for some good capabilities in the space. So, you know, I think I think there definitely will be some that will result more successful than others. Michael, you were starting to answer. So why don't, why don't you take it before we wrap up? No, I, I yield my time. Those, those two answered it as well as I ever could. Very good. Well, thank you all so much for uh, sharing for your participation. Really great spending time with all of you. And David, I'll, I'll hand the microphone back to you. 
Thank you so much, Chad. Uh, just looking at those polls, uh, I mean, it's such a fascinating discussion. It's been mirrored by how our audience have responded in those polls. Just have a look at the spread of the vote, specifically on that last one, but also the first one. And OK, there might have been a landslide victory for New Tech in that second poll. But perhaps the more telling point, as you mentioned, Chad, is that, yes, people should continue to invest. And it's great that that's the view of the audience and that sport will recover and invest in what well, we had so many suggestions. It's great that women's sport is being backed. Some really strong thoughts from Al there saying that investors should be invested in women's sport from an operations perspective as well, not just putting up the dollars, but growing those teams and leagues and, and hearing a bit from Michael on Athletes Unlimited and the focus on women's athletics over there. Obviously, we're going to have a lot of focus on, on tech and innovation. And, and Michael saying the best tech is, is simply the tech that connects the brand uh, to the consumer or fan in the best possible way. Absolutely chime with all of that. Um, the digital and new engagement uh, opportunities that, uh, that that Al talked about. And, and those innovations like the quarantine tournament that Colin mentioned as well, one of the innovations that we've seen whilst we've been in lockdown. But how I suppose innovation and, and how things are changing is reflected in the makeup of, of uh, different organizations, having chief technology officers, chief marketing officers that, that Chad mentioned as well, trying to maximize that connection, that engagement with the fan. That remains the, the key lesson really to take away from all of this. And then moving into social impact and, and how sport is such a wonderful vehicle to affect positive social change. Should we have an equity officer in every organization? It's a really good question, Al. I do think it's something that we should consider and really making sure we represent diversity and inclusion. And then, of course, you know, we went onto that, onto that final poll and just trying to work out what the next uh, fastest growing sector in the sports industry uh, will be. Uh, if you saw my notes, they're an absolute mess. But what that means is it's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. Uh, thank you so much to Michael Massimo, Al, Colin and Chad, particularly for, for guiding the uh, discussion so expertly. Thank you to all of you for being here as well. And, and also, we know that we've had a few challenges with the tech, with, uh, with the, the, the broadband and, of course, the audio. But remember, we are joining you from all over the world. And particularly thanks to those stateside for getting up early to be part of our discussion. Next Thursday, by the way, everyone, we're looking at sports sponsorship and exploring some of the innovative ways that brands and rights owners are adjusting to this new kind of virtually dominated landscape would be the way that I put it. Uh, we'll be rejoined by another group of industry experts. We hope it will be another fascinating discussion. So make sure you stay close to uh, 11 Sports and World Football Summits, the social channels. We look forward to seeing you next Thursday. But in the meantime, enjoy the rest of your week and weekend. Goodbye. Thank you.